new topic uh, around uh, the ankle arthritis disease. So it is uh, with great pleasure that uh, we meet today for this new session on ankle arthritis disease. We welcome uh, uh, Professor Jean Briot from the University Hospital of Tours who will present uh, his experience on this always uh, complex surgical indication. The session will be then moderated by uh, uh, Francois Lins, who some of you already know for his uh, research uh, program with uh, curve being and uh, the weight bearing CD scan. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it is again with great pleasure that uh, we are invited, uh, we are inviting the Professor Jean Briot. And Jean, if you please would like to, to present your talk. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Gregoire. Greeting to everyone. So I'll try to, uh, I'll share my, um, my screen with you, if it's okay. I think we're good to go. So this will be dedicated to the uh, technique we, we've been using in the, uh, in the department for the last uh, uh, almost uh, 20 years, except that we refine that technique. And currently we're using the, um, the anterior uh, fusion plate that was designed with uh, new clip technique. Um, here we go. Here are my disclosures. I have no potential conflict with this presentation. So the big deal recently is the uh, shift that we observed in the paradigm of care uh, related, uh, related to the uh, ankle, well, the treatment of end-stage ankle osteoarthritis and a big shift toward the ankle fusion, the ankle uh, replacement, sorry. But still, the the fusion remain, especially for young, young patients. Although it became, at least in my institution, some sort of a salvage procedure, meaning that uh, fusion will be indicated because of contraindication of total anchor replacement of failed uh, procedures such as supramalleolar osteotomy or uh, ankle replacement. And it's a must succeed procedure, although it's not as, as simple as it was. And we are due to preserve some hope, some hope for a secondary conversion to a tendon ankle replacement. So who are we dealing with? We are dealing with male younger male, I mean age 60, but they are frequently younger than that, especially for the uh, fusion candidates. They have a higher BMI. It's 78% post-traumatic as reported by Valde Rabano and colleagues. Those patients are usually, have usually high activity level expectation. And because of that, they are at high risk of adjacent joint compositary osteoarthritis. So we must keep, keep the, uh, the door open for a, a secondary um, uh, takedown to ankle uh, arthroplasty. So our surgical strategy is based on patient preparation, anatomical surgical technique, and the use of modern fixation technique. So the aim of the ankle fusion is uh, to obtain a painless, centered, stable ankle through, throughout the ankle fusion or the fusion of the ankle joint, meaning that we want to obtain a functional foot. And our duty as orthopedic surgeons is to prepare the patient for treatment to realign the ankle and the foot, both of them, to prepare the joint for fusion, and to fix the ankle until fusion is obtained. And the 
keep a door open for a secondary conversion. So it's not the, the most fancy part of the, the treatment, but it is an important part as well. And for those patients, we need to deal in advance with risk factors such as diabetes, we are expected to have a, a HbA1c below at least 8%, 6, 7% is good. No smoking is allowed in our institution. Um, alcohol abuse must be detected and uh, poor nutrition status, especially with those patients who had been through bariatric surgery is uh, mandatory. Immunosuppressive therapy as well as vitamin D deficiency are dealt with, but uh, this is something which is related for rheumatoid patients more than uh, less, which is less frequent. So we need to, uh, to build from the ground up to end up with a sole perpendicular to the leg both AP and medial lateral, to have a foot oriented along the flexure and extension axis of the knee, and to push the talus back under the pylon in order to unlock the Chopard joint, as you can see here. So first of all, dealing with deformity correction. So there are two uh, aspects to it, the one without bone defect, and the correction of deformity would be dealt with tendon lengthening and ligament relief. As you can see on this example on the right hand side of the, the screen, although the uh, ankle fusion was performed uh, correctly, um, this patient that was referred to me with a substantial equinus because of the lack of uh, resection of those uh, osteomas. Whenever there is a large bone defect, either on the right side or both sides, but usually it's on the right side, you have the normal side to use as a template to reposition the talus and to lock the talus back into place. Then you just have to squeeze the fibula to the tibia and you end up with something with, which is more easy to deal with. The cabbage feet need to have a special, a special attention because the, the tendency is to uh, switch the, the equinus that is within the, ta the, the foot, which is the cavus, to the, the equinus that is within the, uh, the ankle. So we need to uh, avoid over dorsiflexion of the talus when dealing with the, uh, this, uh, this ankle or osteoarthritis on a cavus foot. So uh, the approach first about the joint exposure, it's minimally invasive as much as possible. Ideally, the uh, astroscopic uh, approach is probably the best. My workhorse here is the anterior approach because it's the one that we commonly use to perform most of the ankle uh, uh, surgery, both the subramaleolar osteotomy and the uh, ankle uh, arthroplasty and revision as well. We prepare the joint with osteophyte removal and cleaning both maleolar and then uh, see if bone grafting is, which is required. So one shall choose the joint exposure according to the bone loss and the fixation method that we have uh, agreed upon uh, before. So joint preparation is basically some sort of debride of debridement. It's uh, we try to to have uh, an anat anatomical debridement and not to uh, induce any bone loss or destabilizing the, uh, the ankle. We use a burr um, 
uh, with limited uh, rotation in order to avoid burning the, the bone and do the drilling and the fish scaling as, uh, as it was proposed to expose the subgondral bone without inducing any bone loss. So the technique which was uh, basically invented or promoted initially by Ted Hansen and the, uh, the team from Harborview is to uh, maintain congruency of the joints because it's a, a big part of the, the stability that will, will achieve as, after debridement. And it's basically adjustment of both sides of the uh, arthrodesis. So we try to preserve the joint contour during joint preparation and the amount of contact area. Doing so, as you can see on the left-hand side of the uh, the slide, you increase the stability and you, you create the environment in which one, uh, one is going to, uh, to do the fusion. And this has been extensively uh, studied and tested as uh, by Vasquez and, and uh, colleague in clinical biomechanics. Again, preserving the bone anatomy is to prevent bone loss. So there may be some pre-existing bone loss because of trauma or just because of wear. As you can see here, once you have realigned the, uh, the hind foot and the ankle, uh, you realize that there is this bone loss due to wear. So our understanding is that the, the bone loss is uh, evaluated after joint debridement and joint deformity correction. You may have central bone loss either on the talus or on the pylon or segmental bone loss such as uh, the the talus especially in in case of a total ankle replacement revision or in case of uh, deficiency of the obanoli so we try to avoid resection or of either the medial or the lateral manoli the lateral malleoli which is the fibula we try to keep this lateral column which uh, prevent from uh, this drifting of the, the ankle and the hind foot into valgus. And we try to uh, spare the, the medial malleolus, uh, mainly because of the uh, vascularity that it brings to the, to the fusion. So basically we try to determine the level of cystness required from the implant once the, uh, the bone deficiency or the bone segment uh, are dealt with. And you may know that you can increase the stability of the fixation of the, arth of the arthrodesis with the uh, fixation device, the ICs. So basically when whatever kind of fixation method you, you use, you end up with uh, something which, which is between uh, 20 and, and 50 Newton per meter or per degree, depending how you, you measure it. And the, the simple anterior plate augmentation uh, induce uh, an increase of uh, stiffness around twice either in bending or in torsion. So the, the uh, association of compression screw with a standard method and an anterior plate provide uh, increased uh, stability and stiffness of the construct in bending, uh, both uh, dorsiflexion 
it's a buttress, plantar flexion. It will be act as a, acting as a tension band and in terms of inversion or inversion, it, uh, it acts as a neutralization plate. So it's basically uh, as an approach which is similar to the one we use when we add some kind of a neutralization plate to the fixation of the, of the comminuted fracture. So it's not so much about the stiffness of the device, but how multiplanar the construct is. So uh, first thing first, uh, we usually do the, the fixation, the screw fixation first. We use the uh, tripod construct uh, described by the group from Harborview. Uh, at the very beginning, we only used that technique. And now we use the first screw of the technique, which is, uh, which was used to be named the, the home run screw. The home run screw was this uh, posterior lateral screw, which uh, came from posterior lateral all the way down to the, the neck of the talus to end up with a good uh, purchase into the neck of the talus. Currently, we mainly use the posterior medial screw. Um, this screw has to be uh, positioned at, uh, at least 45 degrees if you want, to, if you want it to be uh, efficient. We use either 4.5 or 6.5 millimeter uh, screws and we moved from uh, 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 standard screws to cannulated screws nowadays. So these first screws provide compression on the, let's say, normal side of the of the joints. For example, if uh, this is a a various ankle after plant ankle with the wear on that aspect uh, more often than not we will use this posterior medial screw first because of the the, the normal aspect of the uh, the ankle after debridement and the the, the the bone deficiency on the medial side of it and i'll show you an example later And afterward, either one or two screws, one need to pick up a plate. So the question is, which plate will you work with, learn to work with? And during the, these last 20 years, I've been working with a, a wide range of, of plates. So one, I've, one has to pick between stainless steel and titanium and we we started with stainless steel and nowadays we, we move to titanium because of uh, our compatibility with the rest of the uh, fixation device we use and um, the young model which is uh, probably better uh, re re regarding to uh, the uh, uh, bone bone healing, although it has, it has only been proven for uh, uh, spine, I think. The second aspect is the design of the implant, whether you want it to be uh, anatomical or symmetric, the length, if you want to extend the purchase on the, on the limb uh, in case of uh, bone deficiency, and here we are talking about uh, uh, segmental bone defects, especially in those uh, uh, infected uh, non-union of the pylon, which is not uh, infrequent. And the, uh, the number of screw you want to, uh, to end up with, 
the more screws, the better it is. Since I, I previously mentioned that it's the, uh, the volume of the construct that is uh, important. If you select uh, uh, a plate with only two large screws in the neck of the talus, uh, you may end up in hot water. You need to uh, choose the size of the screws and the length of the screws you will be using and whether you want the locking mechanism to be mono or polyaxial. And the last, but probably the more important, is the range of plate. You can pick up a plate, but my advice would be to pick up a range of plate. A range of plate compatible with your foot fixation system, a range of plate with which you'll be able to perform both TT fusion, ankle fusion, and TTC fusion, which is pantalar fusion. A range of plate that will be both anterior, lateral, or posterior, because you have a skin condition to deal with, and a range of plate that can provide standard mini and long plates because uh, patients are quite different in terms of uh, size and height. So basically, you know that plate augmentation increases the stability during healing, and that's what you're aiming for. Uh, biology you can deal with, but our uh, duty as orthopedic surgeon is to fix thing. One of my colleagues used to say, uh, we need to make it stiff. Um, if it ain't stiff, it ain't no use. Those of you speaking English will know what I'm referring to. Um, so plate act as a tension band, a buttress plate, and a neutralization plate. But in this case of the uh, new clip plates, it acts as well as a washer, because you, you will put the uh, anterior leg screws through the plate. And this can uh, be useful whenever there is a deficiency of the anterior part of the pylon. It maintains coaptation throughout the bone resorption process, which always occur. And when you only uh, use crew, there is some sort of uh, some sort of competition between the uh, the bone resorption process, which which is physio physiological, and which will lose or will end up with some sort of loosening of the the, the screw. So there is a, a competition between the healing process and the, uh, the, the stability of the construct. We use uh, plates whenever there is a poor bone stock, when there is a sever or a fixed malalignment, when there is a metabolic disease, or when patients have high activity level expectation, either because they are huge or because they, uh, they want to go back to, uh, to hard work or running. So this is how we select our patient, patient that can have access to, uh, to, to arthroscopic fusion, uh, will have uh, obviously arthroscopic fusion. So our surgical strategy has to deal with the main issue here, such as the skin condition. Imagine you have to deal with this patient that was referred to me uh, one year ago, sorry, with this uh, ankle arthroplasty, which was already revised once or twice. So, you need to ask yourself, what is the skin condition? 
So what will be the approach I will be uh, choosing? If there are any uh, foot or ankle deformity, try to uh, evaluate the bone loss you will have to uh, deal with once the, uh, the deformity uh, will be corrected or once the, the implant will be removed and the bone fixation method you will uh, able to, to pick. Uh, will there be any uh, enough bone to, uh, to have a good purchase without uh, um, uh, anchoring, anchoring in, the, uh, in the heel? Do you want to sacrifice the subtalar joints? All that kind of question you have to, uh, this checklist you have to, uh, to address before bringing the patient to the OR. So first case, a uh, 34-year-old male, uh, 35 BMI, diabetic, without insulin. The uh, HbA1c is okay, 635 is a non-smoker, so there is no issue with that. He has a history of polytrauma, with this uh, ankle fractured with a malunion of the uh, fibula, uh, united but malunited, and this uh, early ankle osteoarthritis. Uh, this is an end stage osteoarthritis, um, deep ankle pain when walking. The, uh, the pain level is uh, seven on a zero to 10 scale, crutches. So he's young and the, the foot is supple enough so we can spare the, uh, the subtalar and the Chopard joint, but he has a clotus due to a compartment syndrome that, we'll, that we'll have to deal with uh, during surgery. So this is what I did. I used the, uh, the anterior approach and uh, with the previous uh, approach. I removed the, the screws without uh, problem. Ankle debridement was uh, relatively easy in this case. I started uh, the fixation process with the posterior medial leg screw. Then I use the uh, anterior plate as a washer to put the second anterior screw, which provided me with a stable construct. And then I just had to uh, lock the plate into position. Uh, this is a standard plate and as you can see here I could use a uh, the two row of screws. Um, since then uh, a uh, plate with a single row of screws was developed especially for patients with a, a short neck or uh, uh, small patient. So the post-op protocol is uh, currently non-weight bearing for six weeks and then uh, weight bearing with a walking boot for six weeks. After uh, 12 weeks, the patient will go back to, uh, to standard rehab. They usually don't have a CT scan performed if uh, uh, weight bearing was uh, obtained without pain. If there is any abnormal pain, then the patient are instructed to stop weight bearing and uh, have a, a CT scan to make sure that everything's all right. And I've seen this uh, young man a uh, few few months ago at the the end of last year. So his walking distance was non-limited. We still have 
occasional pain, but uh, nothing, uh, uh, nothing tremendous, nothing uh, limiting, not, no, no pain he would have to uh, take painkiller for. And uh, he had a uh, normal shoe wear with a supple hind foot providing uh, around 30 degrees of inversion, eversion mobility. So this is the, uh, the, the, standard, the standard case, the, the usual suspect you have to deal with. Young, healthy, man, overweighted, uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis for, for who you cannot propose a, an ankle uh, arthroplasty. The second kind of uh, case you have to deal is, is those uh, patients with bone deficiency, either because of post-traumatic bone deficiency, I'm, I'm thinking about those patients with a sequela of a pylon fracture, all those patients still young enough, but uh, who were proposed uh, or who had a, an ankle uh, arthroplasty performed probably too young. And the, uh, actually we were supposed to have a revision of that kind of patient today with uh, Dr. Linz. Obviously, this, uh, this has been canceled due to the uh, COVID crisis. So this man is 55 years old, uh, low BMI, um, no smoking habits, no diabetic, uh, nothing specific. This is post-traumatic. He had an ankle arthroplasty performed in 2003. Uh, at least one revision performed in 2011, but I think uh, he had two revisions actually. Um, he ended up with uh, this uh, loose talus and he was referred to me from the south part of France due to uh, ankle pain. So uh, because of uh, his uh, expectation, he still wants to, uh, he's an architect, but it, he still wants to, to work around, he still wants to practice some sport, I advise for a uh, fusion. So there is no issue here with uh, mobility. Um, the foot is relatively uh, pain-free and supple. Um, the scar tissue has, uh, are okay. There are two uh, uh, scars, one which is anteromedial and one which is, uh, which is lateral. Um, uh, the vascularity is okay whenever a patient has been uh, has been traumatized or uh, went through a, a heavy surgery. I usually ask for uh, angio CT. Um, there is uh, the subtalar joint is okay. Uh, hopefully we are lucky since uh, uh, this uh, bone defect uh, is uh, cavitary meaning that uh, I think that when looking at it, we can uh, still uh, perform a, a primary uh, fusion between the malleoli and the, um, and the, uh, the talus, which will leave some time from the, for the bone graft to, uh, to heal. In this case, um, I think the uh, at least one one plate is mandatory and that's how I usually uh, do things. Uh, I recommend the use of an iliac crest. I use the anteromedial approach through which uh, I remove the implant without any uh, really real bone loss. Um, I started by fixing the lateral myelis, which uh, uh, give me a, some sort of a beacon to, uh, to uh, fine tune the, um, the length, the limb length. I wanted to avoid the loss, loss, of, uh, the loss of eight. And um, 
a, a, a good idea of the rotation. Uh, on the medial uh, malleolus, I usually put a K wire, which uh, allows uh, the possibility to fine tune the, uh, the dorsiflexion or plantar flexion of the, uh, the, the fusion. I grafted with this uh, bicortical autograft from the iliac crest. Then I put the uh, the medial uh, the screw in the medial malleolus, and obviously in this case those are no uh, leg screws, but just uh, uh, standard 3.5 screws, and the locking system of the the uh, plate, the anterior plate, uh, provided stability. And uh, he, he was, uh, he, he went uh, okay for uh, wound healing. He was non weight bearing for six weeks, uh, partial weight bearing between two crutches for six weeks as well. And he started uh, weight bearing on a walking boot at uh, 12 weeks. And you get rid of the uh, the walking boot for the next uh, one and a half month. So at one year follow up, he's um, healed, he's fused. Um, he has a non limited walking distance, always occasional pain. He's uh, he's okay. You have this uh, CT that was performed uh, at uh, three months. I guess, because he had some, some pain when uh, first uh, uh, going back to, uh, to weight bearing, which uh, shows primary healing of the, uh, the, the malleoli to the, uh, the talus and the, uh, obviously the, the bone graft uh, will be uh, uh, long to heal. I mean, it, it's usually, uh, there is, there is uh, some sort of uh, remodeling of the bone graft. You end up with a, the nice uh, X-rays at uh, two or three years usually. Um, I don't know if we, oh, we are out of time. So uh, let's switch to the, uh, to the, uh, Q&A uh, session. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> when I share my screen, I couldn't see my uh, my clock anymore. So. But it's not a problem. Maybe we can go to uh, to your presentation, uh, Francois. I haven't seen any any question, so maybe we we will have some question uh, at the end of the of the of the two presentations. But thank you very much, uh, Jean, for for this great uh, presentation. So you want me to step in, Arthur? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so hello everybody. Sorry, I was a little bit late uh, logging in and thank you to New Clip to, to invite us here. Um, and um, Jean told you that uh, by uh, irony, uh, we were supposed to be uh, doing a case together, which was a, a total ankle uh, replacement takedown and uh, ankle arthrodesis uh, using anterior approach, idiot crest uh, graft and a new clip uh, anterior plate, um, which hasn't happened because of the, uh, of, uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, so um, it's a bit ironic, but it's nice to be with you, Jean, here and, uh, and uh, with new clip uh, to share this, uh, this moment with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, and switch to my presentation. So um, I'm going to talk more about some tips and tricks and uh, focus more on arthroscopy. Um, Jean detailed a lot the uh, 
plating side of things, the open surgery. So I'm going to uh, go in a little bit into the uh, arthroscopy side of things and especially a few tips and tricks that, that we've uh, developed and published in order to help us go beyond the usual indications uh, for arthroscopy and see how we can deal with more uh, complex deformities. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this uh, OSF in French, it means, it means fibular subtraction osteotomy. And it was described by my colleague, Dr. Mehdi, um, and we published it in the French uh, orthopedic journal uh, in 2017. And uh, the idea came after a realization that sometimes uh, you, uh, you do get uh, perioperative fractures of the fibula when you're doing an orthodesis, uh, most of the time involuntarily, of course. Uh, but sometimes you think like, I, I was struggling on this orthodesis and then the fibula snaps and suddenly it's easier. Um, so at the beginning, there was this thought process uh, which made us realize that one of the uh, problems that we had was that the fibula is uh, often stiffened, the syndesmosis uh, is stiffened, and, um, and it, uh, it uh, prevents us from correctly reducing the, the talus within the, the tibia talar mortis. Uh, so we then decided to um, uh, go further and actually perform an, a systematically an osteotomy of the fibula uh, in our open ankle orthodesis. Uh, and uh, we have published the results of that and, and this technique. And we found that it was uh, helping us to reduce the rotational deformity, but also to move the tailor body upwards and to get a better contact uh, between the two uh, bone surfaces. So we have an increased contact surface area. We uh, are better at uh, rotational deformity correction. Uh, we have a feeling that we get better stability, better contact, and less need for grafting. Of course, you do have a little bit of uh, uh, loss of height, so you have to be careful uh, regarding the limb, uh, lower limb length if uh, the limb is not already too short uh, and if you can actually afford to, to do it. Uh, in, our, in our series, this is Dr. Medi's series, uh, he had 42 cases and he obtained 97.6% um, fusion uh, and 100% fusion on the fibula. And it's important to note that the fibula is not fixed, it's just left as is. Uh, and, um, and it's still fused in this series anyway, in 100% uh, percent of cases. Um, the other trick that we did is we transposed this idea into uh, the arthroscopic uh, uh, ankle arthrodesis because it, it's, it, it's supposed to be limited in terms of uh, the importance of deformities that you can um, uh, correct traditionally under 10 degrees of virus or, or valgus. Um, and, and when I started uh, uh, doing uh, arthroscopy, I, I, I was told that it was sort of an, a contraindication to uh, do an arthroscopic fusion if, if, if I had uh, a deformity that was uh, greater than 10 degrees. Now, what I realized using weight-bearing CT, for example, is that uh, the, this 10 degrees in an X-ray is not correct. You don't know if it's 10 or 15 or five degrees. So there were a number of uh, open ankle arthrodesis that we did where we thought this doesn't look like it's so deformed. We could have done it arthroscopically. Um, and then there was the realization that with what we called FIRE, so that's fibular intraarticular resection endoscopy, we could uh, uh, basically snap the fibula and that would help us correct deformities that were uh, more important. Uh, and so we also published this uh, in arthroscopy techniques and uh, the it's an open journal so you you can have access to this uh, to this uh, to the full uh, full text article uh, so we have the same uh, advantages basically so obviously less need for grafting stability deformity correction rotational deformity correction and increased contact surface area using this uh, technique so you can see here um, uh, that you do this uh, in a stepwise manner, starting from the anterior aspect of the fibula here, uh, using, we use a 4.0 burr or, or a 4.5, uh, and you resect the cartilage and, and the, you scratch, basically only just scratch the, the surface. 
And then it's nice to have a small periosteal elevator that you can uh, slide behind the fibula right to the back. And you can then uh, put the burr uh, behind the fibula. Uh, that means on the skin side of the, the, the fibula. This means that with the shield on the burr, you can protect the soft tissues on one side and you can uh, ream uh, towards the bone uh, coming back onto the axial uh, or median uh, um, side of the of the ankle. Uh, so this is what it looks like at the beginning. Uh, and this is where you go behind the fibula, uh, uh, picture C here, and picture D is uh, uh, reaming right to the back. And so it, it gives you a, 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 about a five millimeter space, which frees up the rotation and allows you to move the whole tail body up. Um, okay. The last trick I want to talk about is the joystick uh, trick, which we call JOT. And this came directly from uh, the findings that we had using weight bearing CT, where you can actually see the internal rotation of the talus when the patients are weight bearing. And you realize that uh, there's a large amount of varus in, in those majority of cases that we see that are uh, um, uh, arthritic cases following chronic lateral ankle instability, uh, a, a large amount of the virus is actually due to uh, subtalar uh, uh, compensation of ro internal rotation of the uh, uh, tailor body. Uh, so the idea is to use, uh, again, we published this and, and it's an open access journal, so you, you can have the, the, the full text. Uh, and there's also a video uh, each time, so you, you can find that on the web uh, quite easily. So we're, we're talking about uh, lateral instability of the ankle resulting in uh, secondary arthritis, uh, which are the majority of cases, but it's, it's also valid in uh, valgus ankle arthritis uh, related to uh, um, uh, medial instability. Uh, so the idea is to use this uh, uh, pin, which is here uh, inserted uh, through the uh, lateral portal, uh, and we we use it to correct. So you have to you have to put it in the lateral portal a little bit anteriorly, and then you pull back to correct this uh, uh, malrotation of the ta of the the tailor body. And, and once you're in, and, and once you're in place, uh, you control the dorsiflexion of the ankle with your belly. Uh, and one of my mentors said that the, the belly is the surgeon's third hand, and, and it's actually in arthroscopy, it's really true. Uh, and then we pin the tailor body into place with two, uh, two K wires on which we then insert the, um, the, uh, the screws. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, fixation, um, we use the 6.5 uh, uh, millimeter screws and we use two of them, sometimes three, uh, when the uh, quality of the bone is not satisfactory. If, if it's a young person who, has, who is active and has hard bone, uh, we find that uh, two screws are sufficient. And this technique was published, I think it was 2012, uh, by Ian Winson and his team in, in Bristol uh, on, on a series, I think it was 230 cases or, or something, and they had 97% of uh, fusion. But they didn't have the fire, so the uh, fibula uh, resection uh, osteotomy. If they had had that, obviously they would have had 100% fusion um, or not. Maybe we, we, we have to do the study now. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, no, I don't only do uh, arthroscopic ankle fusions, even though these tips and tricks have greatly increased my uh, indications. Uh, so I, I do uh, uh, open cases, and for these, my preferred approach is the transfibular Crawford Adams approach. Uh, and so somehow, uh, even open, I managed to use the new clip screws rather than the plates, but sometimes I also have to use the plates, for example, in uh, ankle, uh, uh, total ankle replacement takedowns. Uh, what I like about the Crawford Adams uh, is, uh, for example, uh, in, in this case, there's an equinus, so it's not a rotational uh, 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 problem. I won't be able to correct it uh, by resecting uh, lots of bone on the tibia or the talus. 
uh, there's obviously a lot of, uh, it's a post-traumatic case, there's a lot of posterior soft tissue retraction. I have to have a large approach that enables me to go posteriorly and, and release the soft tissues, uh, release the Achilles tendon. Uh, so in this case, I choose an, uh, an, uh, an open approach. What is good um, uh, also about this uh, technique is that you can also access uh, the subtalar joint if you need to. Uh, using exactly the same uh, the same approach, so it's a rather large large approach because you need to be able to mobilize the fibula uh, posteriorly, uh, but you can always extend it uh, distally and do a little anterior curve uh, on on the approach to reach uh, inside the subtalar joint uh, and perform a TTC fusion if you need to. Uh, so uh, the, the fibula itself is a vascularized graft uh, and it increases the contact surface area of, of bare bone. Uh, it increases the stability. It's like a, a biological plate. Um, you could argue that, uh, I'm saying this because I know Jean is going to, to argue this, but uh, that the fibula is like when you've got, a, 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 for example, a total ankle takedown. Uh, like the ankle doesn't exist anymore, the, male the uh, medial malleus doesn't exist, the tater body doesn't exist, sometimes the calcaneus is partly gone as well. So basically you have nothing and the only thing that's holding the foot is the fibula. Uh, so that's sort of true, but we're not always in these extreme uh, situations. And even in these extreme situations, uh, once everything is gone, you can see that the fibula is moving, the syndesmosis is, is, is moving a little bit. Uh, the, the proximal tibio fibular joint uh, also has a certain degree of uh, mobility. And while during the operation, it might be tricky to, uh, for example, find the right position uh, for the foot relative to the leg, uh, then you can actually increase the stability by fixing the fibula into the tibia, uh, which gives you another anchor point. Uh, so um, if, if you're confident with the fact that you can hold the foot in the right position, uh, then Usually, uh, if you, once you've anchored the fibula into the tibia, that, that gives you an excellent stability uh, and, and, uh, to, to, in order to finish the, uh, um, the operation. Uh, here are just a few pictures of, of uh, this case and, and the last uh, one with the, the two screws that are in place here. Uh, so in this case, uh, there was, was a traumatic case. There was... Um, there wasn't a great deal of bone loss. We had to resect a little bit anteriorly and we released the Achilles tendon, we released posteriorly, but we didn't have to uh, augment the bone. We didn't have to do a structural graft. Uh, so the construct was really solid as soon as we put in those two screws. And then the, the closing the, uh, the fibula on top of it, uh, uh, like a, a plate, a biological plate, increasing this stability even more. But, uh, where the nucleate range is really uh, interesting is that you've got this anterior lateral plate, and in, in our experience, it's the only one that is compatible with uh, the uh, on the market with uh, uh, the Crawford Adams approach. Uh, so, you in 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 the cases of um, uh, total ankle uh, uh, takedown, you can still use this approach uh, and uh, use an anterior lateral plate. Uh, so, just to to end up on this. Uh, the, this is the, the nucleus screw range. Uh, so I use the uh, di diameter four and the 6.5, and you, you also got much uh, bigger eight millimeter, uh, sorry, 6.8. And there's also an uh, eight millimeter screw uh, diameter, which I don't use because um, I, I don't, um, I prefer the, the smaller screws. Um, and, uh, you know, the talus is a rather small bone. So, so like two, six millimeter, uh, holes in that it's like it's 1.2 millimeters it's one centimeter it's already a great big hole in that talus uh, so and I use the four millimeter screws to close the the fibula uh, autograft so thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, attention and uh, I think now we'll be uh, open to questions Well, thank you, Francois, for joining us today and for this uh, uh, very nice presentation. I think that uh, overall it was uh, quite comprehensive from the presentation from uh, Jean uh, uh, and, uh, and your, uh, uh, Francois. So, well, I think it's up to uh, the 
the surgeons uh, here uh, to to ask the question and um, or you can also ask yourself some question because as far as I understand you have two different approaches of um, of this pathology and uh, and um, probably you, you can engage that conversation around the, around this. Thank you. I I do agree with uh, François regarding the. Uh, um, and his approach to uh, to the arthrox the arthroscopic fusion of the ankle, and I I'm not, I I try to find out, but I think I, I I've read one or article from Winston about uh, the influence of uh, preoperative deformity of the ankle and uh, his uh, use of um, the fibular osteotomy. But then um, I think it's a British uh, JBGS. Uh, I'll find out some more. But uh, sh sh long story short, I think that the, the, uh, the fibular osteotomy is probably better when performed with ankle arthroscopy because you don't lose that stability which is provided, provided by the, uh, the fibula and which provide both uh, uh, and, and help regarding the, uh, the, 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 position, the proper positioning uh, as a beacon and as a constraint of the ankle. What's your thought on that, Francois? Well, the, Jean, there's one of the things I do in life is I, I don't disagree with you uh, to begin <laughs> in <laughs> because you've, you've always read the single uh, paper that I haven't read and, uh, and uh, you'll end up being right. But um, I, think, uh, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, I, it's definitely, um, I think it's, uh, it's easy to do in arthroscopy. It takes, yes. now it takes me less than 10 minutes. Um, so it's it's really interesting it increases it really adds something and i'm not so sure that um the crawford adams approach adds so much because so i might be wrong on the literature side of things but i haven't found a paper that really uh, um, provides uh, significantly different results in favor of using this autograft this vascularized graft in the crawford adams as compared to using an anterior approach and and not using it. I think it also works if, if, you, if you've got, for example, a bone block that, that uh, acts as a strut uh, in, in the sagittal plane, but if it also comes into contact with the fibula uh, and the medial malleolar that, and then you freshen them as well, uh, then it will still act as a, as, as a biological supplement. Uh, and it's true that um, in, uh, in my experience, um, I, I haven't struggled so much with this beacon uh, because I use the Crawford Adams in cases where I don't use arthroscopy. So they're usually very stiff and I'm not very confident with correcting the deformity in arthroscopy. So that's why I switched to an open approach. And in that case, I find that the Crawford Adams actually helps me correct the deformity because otherwise it's just too stiff and I, I, I can't find my way around it. So uh, freeing it, freeing everything up and having this approach where I can really go right behind the tibia. You can really uh, release everything posteriorly because it's, it's an anterior lateral approach, but you can still go right behind the, 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 the tibia and you can even release the, the medial, uh, uh, the, the medial um, uh, collateral plane without having to do a secondary incisions because it's a rather large incision, but the skin is correctly vascularized. So you, you have no problem increasing the length of the incision. So you can go, you can wrap your hand right around the tibia and you can even release the medial side. Um, and so I use it in, in those really stiff cases. And in the other cases, I tend to use uh, uh, more of the uh, arthroscopy. So um, I guess that uh, in those cases, post-traumatic, uh, I guess it's not really a problem, but in case of uh, the case that we, we, we were supposed to be doing right at this moment together, which is a total ankle uh, takedown, uh, where it's really lax and nothing is holding, 
uh, cutting that fibula might definitely be a problem. And it's, um, it's one of the reasons why for this case in particular, we, we, we discussed it and we chose to, to go the anterior way. Um, so so I, would, I, I would agree with you, but f I would fine tune this uh, uh, remark by saying that uh, it, it, it is a problem if it's a lax ankle and there's a great big bone loss. But if it's a very stiff ankle, it's actually useful. I agree. I really, the, uh, I'm not so sure about the, uh, I mean, I, I'm not so comfortable regarding the, the fine tuning of the rotational positioning of the, uh, the ankle whenever there is a, a fibular deficiency. And that's the only real issue I have. So, uh, I mean, whenever it's um, minimally invasive or arthroscopic, you don't have this uh, issue at all. So uh, I do agree with you. And I think that it, it, it even is more useful when used uh, with arthroscopy than um, when it's used uh, open. But uh, you will agree, and I will share my screen with you guys if you, uh, if you don't mind that, uh, uh, can you see my screen here? This weekend? Yes. That uh, taking down this kind of uh, failed ankle fusion uh, to a, an ankle arthroplasty is easier than uh, doing it whenever you have these kind of cases. So keep in mind that, uh, once you have uh, you have cut the fibula, uh, it's uh, it has to succeed. Yeah. If not, it's going to be significantly <laughs> more more complicated. There is one question for you, gentlemen. I think it's uh, Francois. If you, if you would like to to lead the, this question. Yes, there was a question. Uh, yeah, from Dr. 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 Lintz, maybe you already explained that, but do you use distraction during arthroscopic fusion? Uh, the answer is uh, I always want to be 100% certain, so I have it in the room, but I never use it uh, because you're actually, uh, you know, when you go into the ankle at first, uh, you're in the anterior chamber, so you start uh, resecting cartilage and, and a little bit, little bit of the anterior and um, and uh, distal part of the tibia and that gives you room to get inside the ankle and then you can just push the burr into the ankle you don't really need the distraction it doesn't it gets you in your way rather than anything else so 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 i don't i don't i really i don't use it i can't say that i uh use it and there's another one from uh, marco lopez so in equinus contractor, do you prefer percutaneous Achilles tenotomy? And do you place your patient in four position? So I don't know what you mean by four position, but cabot. I guess... Cabot, yeah. position cabot. Figure of four position. Oh, yeah, right, position okay. Cabot. No, uh, actually, I, I could have answered the question because uh, I don't change the position. What I do is just, I just, uh, yes, I use percutaneous Achilles tenotomy with three, three stab incisions. Uh, and I just lift the patient's leg up and uh, do it uh, straight, in, straight in front of me uh, by pulling on the, on the foot on, on, on the other side, using a, a beaver, a small beaver rather than a pointed uh, uh, blade. Um, so there's no particular um, uh, there's no particular position for that. The the thing is that uh, in that case the the osteotomy those are really stiff cases and and the osteotomy really helps you. And sometimes I go even further uh, when I really uh, can't find a way out of a, 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 a malposition and stiffness. I also through the lateral approach I do an osteotomy the medial malleolus. Uh, so it's like an extreme uh, version of uh, uh, medial release, but uh, that that really that really does it for you when when you when you need to. Jean, would you answer that question as well? Do you have a different approach or a no. different version of it? Or no, I agree. I, I try to uh, to work my way uh, percutaneously regarding the release of the uh, Achilles tendon. Um, 
regarding the the, the bony part of the uh, of the procedure I, I do it as I as I do it for the total anchor replacement, which is the anterior approach. I do the release, and uh, more often than not, actually, I can't remember any case in which I couldn't push the uh, talus back into position. But I think I, I do such uh, uh, an important uh, ligamentous release that uh, it's the equivalent of uh, of cutting whatever. Uh, Maleola, you end up with, unless once you you reposition the talus, you have something to hold on to. Well, then I would like eventually to 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 add a question myself, probably a little bit more controversial. But when it's time to discuss, uh, and I don't know if you are on the strictly on the same page regarding this topic, but when it's time to discuss um, about patient selection, are you strictly on the same page when it's time to choose? Um, an arthrodesis or an ankle prosthesis uh, for a patient, or do you have a different approach between the two of you? Very because nice. we're seeing also in Europe, in Australia and elsewhere, uh, people do not have always the same uh, algorithm of, uh, of treatment, depending on the patient. And that's why I'm asking you this question, because I don't know if you strictly, uh, if you would strictly choose the same, uh, uh, the same treatments. And how do you, how do, when do you go for an ankle fusion? When do you go for um, uh, an ankle uh, uh, prosthesis? I don't know, you want to start, uh, Francois, or I do? This is, this is exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I don't know, do you want to start, Jean? Uh, but, uh, okay, so I, I, I think that, um, I guess we're pretty similar, um, but, uh, um, I used to do a lot of ankle replacements and then I did uh, quite a lot of ankle takedowns. Uh, and so uh, I did less and uh, now I think I'm gonna do more because um, yeah, it's, you know, uh, I try to be as scientific as possible. And it's true that at the beginning of my career, I may not have been enough scientific um, because I was, let's say, in, a, in an environment that was very pro-prosthesis. Uh, so I did a lot, including in young people. That's definitely something that now I, I consider uh, twice. I said that, um, of course, I, I, I don't want to be speaking in place of Jean, so, uh, but I definitely, what has changed is that I wouldn't do it on someone that is too young. And too young for me is pretty old, I would say, um, probably up to 60 years old, I would think twice. Uh, definitely before 50, 50, I, 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 would, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do a, a, a replacement. Um, there are always, always exceptions. Uh, one of the factors, I guess, is that to be honest, um, you know, ankle revisions uh, after total ankle takedowns, they're pretty difficult. And uh, there's uh, often a very complicated story with the trauma and, and young people uh, who have spent a lot of time in, in hospitals and suffered a great deal. Uh, so, uh, and you know, I'm very confident with bunions. I'm uh, pretty confident with uh, ankle replacements and ankle fusions. I'm, I mean, the thing as a foot and ankle specialist surgeon is that I, I'm always a little bit uh, scared of is doing a, a total ankle um, uh, fusion after total ankle uh, takedown. Uh, of course, the greater the bone loss is, uh, the, the you know the more scary the, the case is. Uh, so I guess that you 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 have to be honest, and this is definitely one of the, one of the factors. Um, the other thing is that uh, solutions. Uh, for uh, for for this particular problems in in, in the problem in terms of uh, hardware uh, are um, are limited. For example, we have very little um, uh, background on uh, uh, total ankle revision using revision total ankle devices. Um, there are also a, a few biomechanical uh, things that bother me is that I, I don't feel so confident trying to make metal fuse with human bone. I just, I don't see how that works. And we had one of our colleagues, uh, Jean-Luc Bess, who recently published an experience on uh, trabecular metal. 
uh, which wasn't so good. Uh, and I, I really trust Jean-Luc in the honesty of his, uh, of his uh, uh, you know, publications. Uh, so, so an ankle replacement is, isn't a big problem. The problem is you're going to follow up that patient and someday he's going to come back and you're going to have to take down this uh, total ankle. And that's, that's when you, you might be in trouble. Um, that's a pretty long answer, but it's it's really a, it's, it's really a big question for 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 ev I think every single foot and ankle surgeon. Um, also, I've uh, think I've acquired a, quite a, a, a significant experience in uh, ankle arthroscopy uh, fusion, and I pushed the limits. Uh, and the last very important factor for me, because I work on this a lot, is weight bearing CT because I know that now. I can measure the alignment of uh, my ankles. And because I know what I'm doing, now I'm going to do more total ankles because I feel more confident with my realignment procedures and with the alignment that I'm able to measure post-operatively. If uh, an X-ray tells me that I've got residual virus on an X-ray, it's just an X-ray, I don't trust it anymore. But if I have a weight-bearing CT that tells me I have residual virus, then I know that the risk for this patient of uh, having a mechanical failure is greater. So I will put him back in the OR and, uh, and, and do something to realign him. So I feel more confident now with weight-bearing CT that I can do additional procedures which will make the alignment of my patients better. And it doesn't solve the biological question of how do you uh, make it so that bone fuses with metal uh, I don't know if this will ever happen. Uh, before we can make this happen, we'll probably uh, all be on the internet and we won't be using our human bodies and we'll all be downloaded on the internet. So maybe before that, we can grow human bone that's perfectly matched with your immune system and, and, and replace your whole, uh, your whole ankle. I think that's, that's more likely than uh, um, being able to make metal fuse with human bone. Uh, so, uh, it doesn't solve the biological uh, uh, problem, but biology can still help us because the Wolf Law says that uh, if you put some stress where you need it, then bone will build at this place. And realigning correctly our patient's feet in order to do this, I think, is a, a, a really a significant way to improve our patient's results. So I feel more comfortable now uh, with doing these additional procedures. And, um, and uh, I would say that now my, uh, my view on the problem is a lot more balanced, to say the least. Uh, and and um, yes, so I, that's, that's my view. It's, it's a pretty long and I, I hope it answers your question, Greg. Um, <laughs> but also we're talking with uh, someone who does this over 60 ankle replacements a year. Uh, when so we do about was a fifth on <laughs> of that of that amount, I know I know you're a cheeky person. Uh, so so uh, I think now it's uh, it's John's turn to to answer your question. Yeah, there is a, there are always some bias. I mean, ten ten years ago, I used to to try to persuade the the patient to have an ankle arthroplasty. Nowadays, I uh, must persuade the, the patient that are referred to me, to me for an arthroplasty to have a fusion. So that's first thing first. Second, I'm, I would say uh, old fashioned or orthodox, which means I try not to uh, be detrimental to my patient, primum non nocere. So if there is, if either option is detrimental to the patient, I will choose the other one. We know now because of the uh, COFAS uh, work, then in stage three and four, uh, going, for, going for the fusion is uh, detrimental to the patient compared to uh, an ankle arthroplasty. So in those cases, I, tr I try as much as possible to, to stick with the, the arthroplasty which provides mobility and reduce the stress and the, 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 the shear on the, the sole of the foot and the skeleton of the foot. 
That being said, um, I think 50, under 50 is probably too young. And the, the, the main issue would be what, what the patient wants to, to do with his life. If he wants to run, then it's uh, either a supramalleolar osteotomy or an ankle fusion, but he will accept the fact that he, would, uh, he will have a, a level of pain which is a little bit, little bit higher. But give and take, this is a bargain that he will, he will take. He will take the ankle fusion or the ankle uh, uh, supramalleolar osteotomy because the aim is to run or go back to running. If it's not the case, well, then the discussion is open. If they want to have, a, there is a middle ground everywhere. So, but I, I, do, I do perform a lot of arthroplasty currently. Of course. Well, thank you for, for your answers. And um, probably last but not least, uh, we never know a question from Spain. When do you use uh, posterior plates? When I cannot approach up front, I have, uh, I will share my screen with you because I, I have an, uh, an example of uh, that kind of, uh, okay, here we are. When you have to deal with that. So this is then called uh, uh, arthroplasty uh, on a closeted tobacco user, which I had to uh, deal with and uh, he ended up with uh, some cement, antibiotics, and a flap. And in that specific case, I could not ap approach the, uh, the, uh, the ankle up front. So I went on the back. And the back is quite useful. It's uh, quite rare that you cannot access from the back. Uh, and you can extend your approach uh, proximally if you have a use defect on the the pylon that's uh, our workhorse here and uh, you can easily extend to the uh, to the calcaneus so it is tricky because it's uh, you don't have to you, i was not um, uh, comfortable at the very beginning working uh, with a patient prone but um, well you get used to it so it's uh, it's Definitely a tool you need in your toolbox. That's why I uh, advocated to, uh, for an an a posterior uh, ankle plate in the range. Um, if I may um, just add a word. Uh, the other thing is that you can, uh, if the patient is prone, you don't have to turn him over if you need the posterior crest, yeah. uh, which is also good. And um, also, I would say exactly the same as usual. It's when you can't approach from the anterior or lateral side. Uh, but having done uh, now a few cases with a, a posterior approach, it's it's scary because uh, there's all the neurovascular bundle, and you know you we're not used to it. Uh, but once you've done the dissection and you're correctly exposed, it's so nice that uh, it tickles me sometimes to, you know, maybe use it for a T TCC, for example, uh, TTCs, even if they, if you can approach uh, them anteriorly. I think from, from the skin point of view, uh, uh, the, the vascularization is, is, uh, is, is good. Uh, there's a there's a big lump of muscle that you can just uh, you, you could use the FHL just to cover up everything at the end, um, and uh, it's really it's really nice. I mean, once it's always a bit scary, but once you're inside, it's it, it feels great. Yeah, what actually, am I saying? Actually, actually <laughs> right, it's right of course there. Actually, it's more difficult whenever there is no bone deficiency, because the only issue you have to deal with is the posterior malleolus. Yeah. And you don't want to get rid of it, especially if it's there. So I think whenever it's, if it's difficult, it's, a, it's not a good indication. Basically, when it's, a, when, it's, when it's very damaged or when there is a bone loss, it's easy, very straightforward. 
I'm all right. I'm I'm seeing another question, again from Spain, and someone is asking uh, that I don't know if this question is 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 to you, uh, Jean, or to Francois. But I suspect well, the the only uh, publication the, the bearing. The there is only, as far as I know, the only uh, publication currently with immediate weight bearing after open ankle fusion is from uh, Beat Interman team with a double plate. Mm -hmm. So immediate weight bearing with a plate is probably possible, but it, 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 has, it hasn't been proven yet. So this lack of uh, evidence in uh, this uh, very tricky world we live in uh, make me cautious not to uh, allow immediate weight bearing to my patient. That's uh, that's the answer. If I okay. were to uh, to be able to allow immediate weight bearing, I would do. I would gladly do so, especially among the neurological patient. So, Arthur, would you have any comments on that regarding uh, the biomechanical uh, elements of our file? If you want to comment. Just from not of, of course not from a surgical standpoint, but from a, a pure mechanical standpoint regarding the, the plate design. Yeah, I know that we all the all the me mechani mechanical tests that are ongoing, and uh, and we receive very good results uh, that will help us just to, to to be able to to go to early weight bearing. I will say, but uh, but yeah, we we are working on everything to have all the proof needed uh, regarding mechanical strength, I would say. I do, uh, I do immediate weight bearing and hydroxychloroquine for everybody and it works great. And I have absolutely no evidence, but it's all right. <laughs> but you live in the south part of France. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. It must be related to that somehow. But I, I don't have any hair. It's, um, well, it's That's not another sign, maybe. Believe me, I stopped that after a few, a few cases of immediate death. So um, yes, um, I, I really love the idea of immediate weight bearing because I love the wolf law and uh, and biology. Um, Actually, the limitation. There is a, there is a I, publication of a good result with immediate weight bearing, only uh, with the ankle. Um, uh, Arthroscopic. Uh, uh, yeah, arthroscopic, arthroscopic yes. And that's why I love paper. the construct with only two screws that are parallel mm -hmm. because it, uh, it doesn't block for the, yes. the titles from uh, moving up because the screws are parallel. This but, is Winston, um, Winston construct. Exactly. So the, the, the thing is that um, I, 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 one of the few um, uh, non-unions that uh, we got using arthroscopic ankle uh, arthrodesis uh, was using this two uh, screw construct and it wasn't immediate weight bearing. It was weight bearing along with the pain at three weeks, starting at three weeks with a walker boot. Uh, but the fact was that the lady was old. She was 78. And I think it's just the bone was too soft and, uh, and the difference between the stiffness of the bone and the, and the screw was too great. And I think that also weight bearing CT will give us a lot of insight into that because you can analyze the bone density and it can give you insight on the quality of the bone. And, and by analyzing lots of cases and lots of data, we'll be able to know uh, where we need just screws or where we need a, a screw and plate uh, construct. So to answer your question, uh, I think there is not enough evidence. We don't have the tool to investigate bone quality uh, so I, I'd be cautious with uh, immediate weight bearing. I think you know a, a minimum of three weeks is required, and and then you can allow some stuff in younger patient, but older patient I'd be I'd be pretty cautious, especially if if it's only screws and no plate. Okay, got it. One 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 last question probably uh, to you, Jean. Uh, in which case and when do you consider to step down to tar after an atrodesis? And, and then what is your surgical strategy, level of cuts uh, orientation? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't really been successful with, uh, with ankle fusion takedown when the ankle is fused because it's too stiff. There is a bony growth all around after the uh, ankle arthroplasty. 
you're very proud of yourself, or at least I was proud of myself, uh, postoperatively, um, not so much uh, three or six months down the road. But on the other side, whenever it's uh, a non-union, it's, it's quite easy. I mean, there is some kind of proof that it's non-united, so maybe it doesn't want to heal. So you come back to the, uh, it, it, basically it's a stiff ankle. It's a, a stiff ankle which had been uh, operated on, but it's a stiff ankle. So if the, uh, the hind foot is stiff as well, or if there is any kind of deformity, you end up being in a, in, in, in a stage three or four of the, OFAS, uh, of the COFAS classification, which is a good indication for the ankle orthotensity. And regarding the, the surgical strategy, level of cuts, orientation, I tried to, to do it as I would have done it initially if this ankle wouldn't have been fused or attempted to, but uh, this is another presentation. It, it takes, uh, and that's why I want to keep uh, it as anatomical as possible. Probably for one another session. And, and Thibaut was, <laughs> was asking, probably this will be our last question, I guess. Uh, does the postponement of uh, weight bearing or reloading also have an impact on the management of postoperative pain and inflammation? Probably, probably. I mean, even, even though you allow patient to to weight bear on, on their feet. If they are painful, they won't. They need to be pain free. They need to be secure. That's why uh, the protocol with immediate weight bearing of the ankle uh, arthroscopic fusion is with a cast. When I do it myself, especially uh, with uh, old people, osteopenic people, not, not very heavy, uh, heavy those are usually old ladies uh, with some sort of neurological issue or blood supply issue. And uh, it works great, but they need, to, uh, they need to have confidence. So the first few steps, you have to do it uh, at their side and to, uh, to prove them that weight bearing is not painful. I think if it's not painful, it's not dangerous that they understand. All right. Any, anything to add, Francois, or we shall eventually uh, close this, this first session, which was, uh, I believe, tremendous? Well, uh, um, unless we have any questions, I think, um, I think we're good. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I would like to thank you for, for, your, for being with us and for this uh, extensive and comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, people have taken advantage of, uh, of your knowledge. And uh, well, uh, see you next time for another session. I believe that in May, uh, even if the confinement is, is, is progress progressively uh, um, released, or opened, uh, I am sure that we'll still have to, to, uh, to adapt uh, our behavior and way of working. Well, thank you everybody again, Jean and, and Francois, and uh, have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Gregoire. Thank you, thank everyone. You.